at school on afternoons. ABC Radio Perth and WA. Mm, we live in an age where everything is automated. Artificial intelligence can do your thinking for you if you can't be bothered. And I think that's part of why it's incredible to hear about the way things used to be done. Uh, Brandon Hibbert has been in the publishing and design industry for decades. And he's head of visual art, fashion and textile design at TAFE. And he's going to tell you why you might like to do a short letterpress course. Good afternoon, Brendan. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Now, can we start with the machine that you are using in this course? Uh, Paint a picture for us. Well, it's a wonderful 1816 American-made Colombian press, and it's often referred to as the Eagle Press because it has a a beautiful cast iron bald eagle on the top lever, which represents a counterweight. Um, and it's about 25 kilos and it acts to raise the platform, um, uh, the platen from the paper after you've made a print. So that's the flagship cornerstone press we use, but we also have a, a number of smaller bench top presses that we, um, we use and experiment on. Right. Um, and I was looking them up this morning just to check that what I imagined in my mind was the same as what you're using. But can you can you tell me exactly how the machine it works? Yeah, so it's it's a little bit like rowing. Um, you rowing some, Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. it's, it's quite a physical um physical upper body process that it, it involves um uh, a big lever that you um, move the platen underneath a, a large printing plate made of cast iron and then you, you grab a lever and you, you, you sort of pull on that to apply an even amount of pressure onto this movable type or any relief object underneath and then um, you wheel it back out again, ink it up again and, and repeat the process. So it's it's a wonderful physical activity. Yeah, labour intensive. So, how do you um, how do you actually set up a page? So, take me through the steps I need to go through to create a page of printed type. So, we've got a, a like a fully functional um, letterpress museum here at North Metropolitan TAFE, um, and we call it the Perth Letterpress Workshop because it's a museum, but it's an active space where we've got antique wood and we've got. Um, cast iron, uh, sort of lead type, and um, and various bits and pieces that you can assemble uh, onto the plate of these printing presses and and create uh, stories or set song lyrics or um, set type, uh, and then you lock that all up either with magnets or um, coin keys which lock your type in place. Um, ink that up with a, a brayer or an inked up roller, and then um, create an impression. Uh, and it's uh, an activity that sort of goes back to the, you know, the 1400s. Um, this, this, you can sort of close your eyes and imagine Gutenberg, you know, creating Bibles um, with movable type way back, you know, centuries ago. And we're essentially doing exactly the same process here at TAFE at the moment. Okay. So I'm imagining the little square letters in the different fonts. Um, and so for each page, do you essentially line those up where they're meant to go and then what happens? Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's it's essentially um, you've got these old-fashioned terms that sort of have carried down. So even the words uppercase and lowercase come from the fact that when you pull out a drawer of type, you usually have the capital letters in the uppercase and then the lowercase or the minuscules in the lowercase letters. And then they're arranged in in essentially the wrong order. So you, you're setting type back to front um, yeah. and 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 so you, you sort of set a line of type vertically facing you um, in a stick um, or on a tray um, and that's, you know, there's uh, terminologies that come from that also such as um, wrong end of the stick if you're on the butt of a joke, for example, oh. if you set type in the wrong hand and your composition stick is back to front then your words and your lines of type will be back to front. Um, and mind your P's and Q's is, is an old saying that would come from not just minding your manners, but it, the P's and Q's actually look very similar um, when they're back to front. And so when you're setting a D or a B or a P and a Q, you have to be quite mindful of not setting it back to front. Yeah, because I would think you set it all up. It's taken you, what, 20 minutes to get it right. You, you pull the lever down and you realise there's one typo. You, you've got to go again, right? That's correct, yeah. So the, most of the presses we have here are proofing presses for that very reason. You, you pull a proof um, and then you read it 
and you look at things such as the space between the letters and the space between the lines of type and just clearly, you know, spelling mistakes in general. Uh, and then you get a chance to reset that type, jiggle it around, um, make it more readable, easy to communicate uh, and pick up your typos and um, and then yeah, it continues. So you've, your first couple of proofs are never fantastic and you have this beautiful um, option to work in 3D where some of the letters are so worn down that they're slightly lower than type height. And so they, they, they need a little bit of paper underneath them or sticky tape just to sort of raise them. So you, now you're sort of working in a 3D to produce a 2D print, um, and that's called uh, Make Ready. And that's where the art is, is, is getting a beautiful, correctly spelt line of type, setting the Make Ready so it, it produces an even result, and you get this beautiful impression. And it's really coming back in wedding stationery, and, and you see it everywhere. People love that old-fashioned impressed feel of, um, of letterpress into definitely soft cotton stock. Yeah, you're right. It is definitely coming back. It's nearly 20 minutes past two. Brendan Hibbert is my guest uh, and he's a lecturer, head of program uh, visual art and fashion and textile design. We're talking about using a letterpress. He's got an 1816 Eagle Press, um, which, which they use. And what is kerning? So K-E-R-N-I-N-G. So when you've got... Um, the, so think of a capital A and a capital W, and if you put them in, in a square or you put them in a, a small block of type, they actually they have this awkward space, and it's, it's due to those angles. Um, you don't seem to have those issues with two Ds placed together or a, um, even an A and a B, but when you've got these angled square letters that you want to bring in together, it used to be a, a kerning file where you would actually physically kern the square the square and, and sort of adjust these two letters and bring them closer together so you have a more pleasing space. And when we see students downstairs setting type, it's the one thing that bugs them the most is you, you can only get it um, so tight. Modern software allows you to get it almost touching. Um, but with when you've got wood block or you've got lead type, you you've really got that do space on to, the edge of the square. Yeah. Yep. So word tracking, when you track type and you make it a little bit looser, that's the entire word. But when you kern type, you're really concentrating on those two characters and that's where the craft and the art comes in, making sure you have beautifully spaced, beautifully kerned and tracked type. Wow. This is this segment is either going to make you more grateful for your printer <laughs> or, or curious about the letterpress. So what, uh, tell me about widows and orphans in the context of the letterpress. Yeah, so... Setting a paragraph of type does take time. It's, it's certainly not a 20-minute activity when you're literally individually placing letters and you're doing that back to front and then you're adding spaces in there and the lead between the lines is also called leading. Um, and so you create a beautiful paragraph of text and then you have this little one word that sits after the paragraph, sometimes called a runt, um, but most commonly called a widow. And so the idea is you've got a paragraph that's um, nicely justified and then you have this word that finishes at the end of it. And so that's a widow um, typically and that's um, the easiest way to remember is widows have a past but they have no future. And so you have this idea of a, a lovely block of text and then this standalone widow. But you also have these things called orphans. Now orphans are lines of type that sit on the next column or um, on the following page and orphans can often come in pairs or threes and so they sit away from the paragraph but on another column or another page. So widows, orphans and runts, it, it doesn't matter you know, what you call them or how you remember them but it's a nitpicky thing that graphic designers um, really sort of aim to uh, fix and craft out of the um, page so that wow. the page looks better. <laughs> How's about those terms, though? Widows <laughs> have have a past but have no future. That's not true anymore, just for the record. Um, <laughs> and sadly, orphans can come into or threes. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, so do you need to be able to read backwards in order to, to do this well, Brendan? Yeah, we're, compositors back in the, uh, I guess, you know, not that long ago when they were setting type, they were able to work at such speed, um, uh, it's it's beyond me. I, I usually have to write it out or, or print it out first and then I hold the paper up to the light or up to the window and that allows me to sort of set type by hand, by eye um, and not make as many mistakes. So you can use a mirror, um, but I find just writing on a thin sheet of paper and holding it up to the light is the best way to 
see which way that your R's are pointing, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So what kind of projects do your students work on? And what do they come to you with? Well, we've we've incorporated the, the graphic design students love the technology and they, they love sitting on, um, you know, the various software, manipulating imagery and type and layout and publishing. But when they come downstairs, we, we actually build this into an OSH unit where they safely create a poster in the workshop and they learn the terminology that we've been talking about now and they, they really slow down and spend their time with the make ready and inking up and getting their hands dirty. So they will create a poster as one of the first things they do when um, our students start graphic design and gives them a great appreciation of how slow it used to take and how lucky they have to have this software and technology now to do it in an instant. Uh, and, and they do it safely um, and they have fun and then we find that they want to return and, and use it to create more experimental posters. There's lovely accidents that happen when you contaminate colours, often known as a split fountain. But sometimes if you just um, have two inks on the on the table and you contaminate the roller and you um, ink up, it's almost like rolling different colours on the type. And even that's a, it's an effect that you can create in this software, but it's a, a lovely experience um, to do that and get off the screen. So that's what design school is all about. It's, you know, it's, it's the opposite of the real world in a lot of senses about Mm -hmm. Um, experimenting and so we call it the school of bad printing and Mm -hmm. we encourage it it's 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 good to experiment get your hands dirty and have these happy accidents yeah definitely um i've got some texts here uh now this one says there's a printing press place in the village at whiteman park where you can see the lovely old letterpress machines i'm sure you're aware of that brendan yes yeah yeah so anong um is uh, now called bright press out in whiteman park and um, she's been a former artist in residence with us. She's done a couple of staff PDs. She mixes colour wonderfully um, with an ink knife. And there's quite a technique to getting what's called a Pantone match. Um, that's when you mix a colour that's in this swatch book. And yeah. she can do it essentially by eye and rolls the ink with an ink knife. And it's just a, a wonderful thing to watch. Oh. She does have some mechanic, um, mechanical windmill Heidelberg presses there as as long as, uh, and as well as the state government's Mele Press, the old government printing office. So Whiteman Park is an amazing um, workshop. It is definitely worth your weekend um, and a fascinating space with Anong out there in Whiteman Park. Oh, that's cool. Um, Darren in Beverly said, how many points are in the Pika for typesetting? Apparently Darren's, uh, mate, Darren's mate used to be a typesetter and used a Pika <laughs> in his work, um, but yeah. Darren doesn't fully remember what it is. Oh, I think it's 72. Um, so I'm sure there'll be someone out there in the radio shaking their fist at me, but I think <laughs> it's 72 points in a pie car. Yep. Uh, and I can tell you that Thai pie is 23.31 mils. Um, so when we do set type with this beautiful old lead type in the workshop, if something's really worn and it's beneath 23.3 mils, um, we have to elevate that slightly. And when we use the laser cutter and we cut, modern logos and we use the modern technology to cut um, polymer and uh, and wood and MDF to let the students explore even more. We have to set that exactly at 23.3. Is this a great exercise in patience, Brendan? I feel like I, I wouldn't be yeah. good at this, but how, how, do, how do some people go? It is. It's, uh, it's a wonderful meditative practice when you you want to make sure that the words you're setting are meaningful. I think mm. I find that I'll go into the space and I know that you have to dedicate some time. You, you can't really hit undo when you're printing either. So if your registration's slightly off, um, it does. You, you do have to really be present. Uh, and I think students really enjoy that the mistakes are encouraged in the space when you have this really corporate. Um, gloss culture of everything has to be perfect and and then they're allowed to essentially let their hair down in the workshop. But there's a, there's a freedom that comes with that too. Yeah. Oh, what an interesting chat. Um, I, I love the idea of a short course like this. So, Brendan, thank you so much for coming on to, to give us a snapshot. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And we've got a few other short courses as well, so ceramics, sewing and jewellery. Yeah. Um, but letterpress fills up super fast. So apologies. Um, the North Metro TAFE website has other short course options and it's, um, it, it'd be great to have um, participants sign up for this next one for Letterpress. Yeah, definitely. I'll get the ABC listeners to come and say hi. Brendan, thanks for coming on. 
Thank you so much for having me. Brendan Hibbert is his name. Uh, lecturer, head of program actually for visual art and fashion and textile design at the North Metro TAFE, which is in Northbridge. Jeff said 72 points to the inch, 12 points to a peaker. Type is 0.918 inch high. And that's Jeff in Rolly Stone, who is a letterpress enthusiast. Oh, I hope he heard that as we said goodbye to him on the phones. Um, now we've got news headlines coming up at 2.30 and then a really interesting chat about